So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the feedback loop, the dialogue between science and science fiction, which I think is actually very useful to both fields. And I'll start with a little bit of career advice. If you want to learn something about a field you know nothing about, I suggest you sign up to write a book about it. Because the prospect of horrifying reviews will terrify you. And as this guy will tell you, fear is a very powerful motivator. Now the other great thing about writing is that authors get amazing access to experts. I learned this 20 years ago. I wrote a book about the rise of the internet as a commercial medium. And everybody who mattered in the industry practically sat down with me for interviews because smart people care about books and they want them to be accurate. Now, um, no school could have replicated what I learned from these people. And as a direct result of that, I did start my online music company called Rhapsody, which those of you with very strong memories may well recall. Um, it, we were actually the first company to get full catalog licenses from all the major record labels, so we did some interesting things quite some time ago. So these interactions with those folks really had a direct, really profound impact on my life. But the honest truth is, I didn't start getting really great access to top scientists and technologists until I stopped writing nonfiction and started writing science fiction. Because this stuff is catnip to ingenious nerds who provide me with amazing fodder for my stories by sharing their thoughts with me. And uh, that is how, in fact, I researched my new book, uh, which comes out in August. I'm sorry that this is all we have because they haven't manufactured the books yet, but anybody who wants one will have grabbed one of these by now. The, uh, this is the prototype. The real thing is going to be this big. Um, it's a long one, and it will also be hardcover. So they only have a few of these at the publishing house. These are what they send out to interview. I'm sorry, to reviewers and so forth. And I wanted to get a couple hundred of these here, but they're like, sorry. And the fascinating thing is, by the way, this is 10% of that, but it doesn't look like it, right? Like, I have no idea how that works. Anyway, we'll get back to this in a second. So researching this new book, um, I wanted to fill it with things I knew nothing about. Things like neuroscience and quantum computing and synthetic biology and, and sex and dating post Tinder, which is a complete enigma to me because I've been married for 10 years. And so once again, I went to the experts. And again, I learned so much from them, I had incredible access. But this time, in addition to enlightening me, they kind of scared me as well for reasons that were oddly connected to the Cold War. Now, back then, we literally spent trillions of dollars to keep two people from blowing up the world. We spent it on all kinds of things, on monitoring, on espionage, on diplomacy, on vast conventional armies, regional wars that let steam out of the system, and none of this was cheap. And the scary thing is today, it costs even more to keep things in balance because not just two, but several people are in a position to start doomsday. So what happens if 20 people get that power, or 1,000? or a million, we couldn't possibly keep a lid on all that. So could this happen? Well, consider these two curves. The slow, boring one tracks Moore's law, which shows how quickly computing power gets cheaper. And we all know how transformative that's been. Meanwhile, the steep, crazy curve shows how quickly genetic sequencing gets cheaper. Um, so what does this mean? Well, it took countless scientists 13 years and $3 billion to read the first human genome back in 2003. Today, not that much longer in the future, you can do that if you've got a thousand bucks, this box, and a little bit of this guy's time. And we're meanwhile getting quite good at writing DNA that does not exist in nature. Now the prices are compressing more slowly this time, and it could take several decades, but eventually, probably in our lifetimes, this person's successor will have access to a print button. And not just him, but tens of thousands of his peers. Because this isn't you know, the next Albert Einstein or Craig Venter we're looking at. This is a lab tech. They could be a smart undergrad in a lab. And a few years after that, it could be a smart high school kid. And a few years after that, it could be a smart eighth grader. But why is that? Well, the simple answer is we all have been living to see it. It's the passage of time makes wizards of us all. There's stocking stuffers out there that Thomas Edison couldn't even have dreamt of. And in fields, particularly, I'd say life sciences, among others, there's a yawning gap that separates the genius required by invention and the mere competence required by replication. I mean, shortly after a Nobel winner beat polio, 
factory workers were mass producing the cure. And much more recently, some truly brilliant scientists rebuilt the Spanish flu virus. And now that gene code is all over the internet. So maybe someday, an eighth grader will hit print on it. Or maybe somebody will come up with a real doomsday bug. Maybe they'll do it for a thesis or some other reason. They'll probably be a perfectly good person with perfectly reasonable motivations. But the danger is, sometime thereafter, countless ungood people could be in a position to unleash it. Well, who in the world would do that? Well, unfortunately, about a million people kill themselves every year. And a tiny, tiny fraction of them try to take as many people with them as possible, as we've seen in very recent headlines. And as we also know, religion, among other things, can be twisted to justify practically anything. Now, the good news is we presently live in an era in which a lone nut can just kill a few dozen people, and only a handful of people get to start doomsday if they want to. But it costs us trillions of dollars to keep these people in line. Who's going to keep millions of us in line? The NSA can't scale to do that. And frankly, as a big believer in property rights, I don't want them to. So maybe it's time for another boogeyman from the science fiction canon, a super intelligence, one that's as smart in relation to us as we are to bacteria. Now that thing could be as omniscient, omniscient and omnipotent as an Old Testament God and save us from ourselves. But unfortunately, some of the world's smartest people say this could end in catastrophe because that super AI could have some really cool things to do with the atoms that happen to make up our bodies and our biosphere. Now, there have been a lot of very serious efforts at modeling scenarios pertaining to the goals that super AIs might have. And some of them have been really whimsical, like the idea of a super AI turning the entire planet into a giant computer to better contemplate pi. But most of these scenarios are dead serious, highly logical, and a far too high of a percentage of them end in our extinction. Now, I actually spent a lot of time contemplating several of these scenarios in my book um, in a, I'll admit it, perversely lighthearted way. Um, but I didn't come away from this book with the glittering clarity that I came away from other books with. I mean, should we entrust our future to a super AI or millions of people who are still in diapers? Or maybe not even out of diapers yet. Now, I don't know, but what you're probably missing in all of this is I am a huge optimist. Dead serious. Um, I actually think we're going to muddle our way through this, and my nine minutes won't, won't allow me time to talk about that. But I really do believe we're going to find our way through this. So why in the world am I painting these crazy dystopian pictures? And the answer is, I think a really important role of speculative fiction in our society is to depict the futures we do not want to inhabit. So at times like this, the people who are creating the architecture of future technologies, those of you in this room, can start thinking really, really seriously about credible scenarios that could happen that we do not want to happen. I personally think George Orwell deserves immense credit for helping to forestall the spread of global, global totalitarianism when, at a time when it seemed almost inevitable by freaking out hundreds of millions of people about what that might mean. And much more recently, I think the people behind Terminator and Ex Machina and 2001 A Space Odyssey have done a very good job of freaking out the right people about the dangers of super AI. People like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who are on that earlier slide, who are thinking very hard about these issues. We want them thinking hard about these issues. So this uh, tenth of the book that I was able to get my publisher to generate for you, um, it opens up, this is all just a long-winded apology, okay? Um, this thing opens up with a pretty creepy, scary AR scenario that could take place probably in five to seven years. I talked to Marone yesterday. He says five. I'm going to say seven. Um, but something that we need to think about now. And there's a lot of other stuff in the book that talks about what could go wrong with synthetic biology, with quantum computing, certainly with artificial superintelligence. Now, putting this together, though, is huge cognitive dissonance for me because I'm an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur forever. And I'm a tech evangelist. I'm an optimist. I believe in this stuff. And I am painting these dark scenarios. And so to bring a little bit of balance into it, 
I'm doing something kind of weird when I release the book, which is I'm going to release it with eight long podcasts that are going to go into depth about each of the technologies and the, and the issues that the book goes into. And that's where I'm going to get to be evangelist, evangelical, evangelicalistical, whatever, yeah, evangelical. And talk about the positive and talk about the exciting. And so um, anyway, the first interview, this is kind of fun, is going to be with our very, oh, yeah, the eight podcasts. That's an iPod. Remember those things? Anyway, first interview is going to be with our buddy Marone from yesterday. And he and I are going to sit down. We had a pre-interview yesterday. We're going to sit down in about a week and a half and hopefully create a 90-ish minute audio document that could take anybody from faint awareness of what AR is to perhaps even top percentile understanding about what this field is like. And I'm very excited about that. And my next guest is going to be somebody that Marone actually mentioned in his talk, Adam Ghazali, a brilliant neuroscientist at UCSF, um, who's doing a bunch of work on video games and how they might be able to help us reverse terrible conditions like dementia. And that's really going to be about consciousness. I'm going to interview a whole bunch of other folks. This is basically the list of folks. Uh, Sam Harris, a really, really important cultural commentator, will be one of my guests. Uh, Cindy Cohn, um, who runs um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, in a, a, a session we're going to be talking about uh, government intrusion. Um, Steve Jurvetson, a brilliant venture capitalist who knows a lot about quantum computing, et cetera. The other thing I'm going to do, which is kind of weird, um, because I do feel guilty about only giving you 10% uh, of this thing, I really hope that we'd have finished books by now, is uh, Random House and I are doing something that hasn't been done before, as far as we know. We're calling it the Founding Readers Program. And when these podcasts come out, it's, you see the page numbers too. So like Marone and I are going to talk about AR for an hour plus. Then in the last 10 minutes, a co-host and I are going to talk about what happened in the first 50 pages in the book, which is what you guys have, which has the AR scene. And that'll be more like kind of like an episode recap type of thing. People who aren't reading the book can just ignore that and not worry about it. But we are going to give away those first four excerpts in installments on a ginormous site that I can't announce yet, but something we've all heard of. And um, it's a pretty aggressive uh, partnership between Random House and this giant site because we all believe in this mission of tightening up the loop between science that's happening now and technology that's happening now and the speculative fiction that gets written about it. Um, so it's a fun project. And if you do want to be part of this and get the first uh, roughly half of the book for free, and there's a, there's a mechanism by which you can get the rest of it super cheap. Again, I wish I could tell you who our partner is, but I can't just yet. It's going to be pretty cool. Uh, you can sign up here after on, after hyphen on, after on was taken, dot com slash readers, and there's like a mailing list, and I can, I can get you on the list to get all this stuff. So there's going to be a panel of three of us later this afternoon talking in greater depth about this dialogue between speculative fiction and science. Um, it's going to be another science fiction author and a great, great editor at Random House, a woman named Trisha Narwani. Uh, so I hope to uh, see you all later on today, and thank you. <laughs>